THE THINKER The house in which Seth Richmond of Winesburg lived with his mother had been at one time the show-place of the town, but when young Seth lived there, its glory had become somewhat dimmed. The huge brick house, which Banker White had built on Buckeye Street, had overshadowed it. The Richmond place was in a little valley far out at the end of Main Street. Farmers coming into town by a dusty road from the south, passed by a grove of walnut trees, skirted the fair ground with its high board fence covered with advertisements, and trotted their horses down through the valley past the Richmond place into town. As much of the country north and south of Winesburg was devoted to fruit and berry raising, Seth saw wagon loads of berry pickers, boys, girls, and women, going to the fields in the morning and returning covered with dust in the evening. The chattering crowd, with their rude jokes, cried out from wagon to wagon, sometimes irritated him sharply. He regretted that he also could not laugh boisterously, shout meaningless jokes, and make of himself a figure in the endless stream of moving, giggling activity that went up and down the road. The Richmond house was built of limestone, and, although it was said in the village to have become run down, had in reality grown more beautiful with every passing year. Already time had begun a little to color the stone, lending a golden richness to its surface, and in the evening, or on dark days, touching the shaded places beneath the eaves with wavering patches of browns and blacks. The house had been built by Seth's grandfather, a stone quarryman, and it, together with the stone quarries on Lake Erie, eighteen miles to the north, had been left to his son, Clarence Richmond, Seth's father. Clarence Richmond, a quiet, passionate man, extraordinarily admired by his neighbors, had been killed in a street fight with the editor of a newspaper in Toledo, Ohio. The fight concerned the publication of Clarence Richmond's name coupled with that of a woman schoolteacher, and as the dead man had begun the row by firing upon the editor, the effort to punish the slayer was unsuccessful. After the quarryman's death, it was found that much of the money left to him had been squandered in speculation and in insecure investments made through the influence of friends. Left with but a small income, Virginia Richmond had settled down to a retired life in the village and to the raising of her son. Although she had been deeply moved by the death of the husband and father, she did not at all believe the stories concerning him that ran about after his death. To her mind, the sensitive, boyish man whom all had instinctively loved was but an unfortunate, a being too fine for everyday life. You'll be hearing all sorts of stories, but you are not to believe what you hear, she said to her son. He was a good man, full of tenderness for everyone, and should not have tried to be a man of affairs. No matter how much I were to plan and dream of your future, I could not imagine anything better for you than that you turn out as good a man as your father. Well, several years after the death of her husband, Virginia Richmond had become alarmed at the growing demands upon her income and had set herself to the task of increasing it. She had learned stenography and, through the influence of her husband's friends, got the position of court stenographer at the county seat. There she went by train each morning during the sessions of the court, and when no court sat, spent her days working among the rose bushes in her garden. She was a tall, straight figure of a woman, with a plain face and a great mass of brown hair. In the relationship between Seth Richmond and his mother, there was a quality that, even at eighteen, had begun to color all of his traffic with men. An almost 
unhealthy respect for the youth kept the mother for the most part silent in his presence. When she did speak sharply to him, he had only to look steadily into her eyes to see dawning there the puzzled look he had already noticed in the eyes of others when he looked at them. The truth was that the son thought with remarkable clearness, and the mother did not. She expected from all people certain conventional reactions to life. A boy was your son. You scolded him, and he trembled and looked at the floor. When you had scolded enough, he wept, and all was forgiven. After the weeping, and when he had gone to bed, you crept into his room and kissed him. Virginia Richmond could not understand why her son did not do these things. After the severest reprimand, he did not tremble and look at the floor, but instead looked steadily at her, causing uneasy doubts to invade her mind. As for creeping into his room, well, after Seth had passed his fifteenth year, she would have been half afraid to do anything of the kind. Once, when he was a boy of sixteen, Seth, in company with two other boys, ran away from home. The three boys climbed into the open door of an empty freight car and rode some forty miles to a town where a fair was being held. One of the boys had a bottle filled with a combination of whiskey and blackberry wine, and the three sat with legs dangling out of the car door, drinking from the bottle. Seth's two companions sang and waved their hands to idlers about the stations of the towns through which the train passed. They planned raids upon the baskets of farmers who had come with their families to the fair. We will live like kings and won't have to spend a penny to see the fair and horse races, they declared boastfully. After the disappearance of Seth, Virginia Richmond walked up and down the floor of her home, filled with vague alarms. Although on the next day she discovered, through an inquiry made by the town marshal, on what adventure the boys had gone, she could not quiet herself. All through the night she lay awake, hearing the clock tick, and telling herself that Seth, like his father, would come to a sudden and violent end. So determined was she that the boy should this time feel the weight of her wrath, that, although she would not allow the marshal to interfere with his adventure, she got out a pencil and paper and wrote down a series of sharp, stinging reproofs she intended to pour out upon him. The reproofs she committed to memory, going about the garden and saying them aloud like an actor memorizing his part. And when, at the end of the week, Seth returned, a little weary and with coal soot in his ears and about his eyes, she again found herself unable to reprove him. Walking into the house, he hung his cap on a nail by the kitchen door and stood looking steadily at her. I wanted to turn back within an hour after we had started, he explained. I didn't know what to do. I knew you would be bothered, but I knew also that if I didn't go on, I would be ashamed of myself. I went through with the whole thing for my own good. It was uncomfortable, that sleeping on wet straw, and two drunken negroes came and slept with us. When I stole a lunch basket out of a farmer's wagon, I couldn't help thinking of his children going all day without food. I was sick of the whole affair, but I was determined to stick it out until the other boys were ready to come back. I'm glad you did stick it out, replied the mother, half resentfully, and kissing him upon the forehead, pretended to busy herself with the work about the house. On a summer evening, Seth Richmond went to the new Willard house to visit his friend, George Willard. 
It had rained during the afternoon, but as he walked through Main Street, the sky had partially cleared, and a golden glow lit up the west. Going around a corner, he turned in at the door of the hotel and began to climb the stairway leading up to his friend's room. In the hotel office, the proprietor and two traveling men were engaged in a discussion of politics. On the stairway, Seth stopped and listened to the voices of the men below. They were excited and talking rapidly. Tom Willard was berating the traveling men. "'I am a Democrat, but your talk makes me sick,' he said. "'You don't understand McKinley. McKinley and Mark Hanna are friends. It is impossible, perhaps, for your mind to grasp that. If anyone tells you that a friendship can be deeper and bigger and more worthwhile than dollars and cents, or even more worthwhile than state politics, you snicker and laugh. The landlord was interrupted by one of the guests, a tall, gray-mustached man who worked for a wholesale grocery house. Do you think that I've lived in Cleveland all these years without knowing Mark Hanna? he demanded. Your talk is piffle. Hannah is after money and nothing else. This McKinley is his tool. He has McKinley bluffed, and don't you forget it. The young man on the stairs did not linger to hear the rest of the discussion, but went on up the stairway and into the dark little hall. Something in the voices of the men talking in the hotel office started a chain of thoughts in his mind. He was lonely, and had begun to think that loneliness was a part of his character, something that would always stay with him. Stepping into a side hall, he stood by a window that looked into an alleyway. At the back of his shop stood Abner Groff, the town baker. His tiny, bloodshot eyes looked up and down the alleyway. In his shop, someone called the baker, who pretended not to hear. The baker had an empty milk bottle in his hand and an angry, sullen look in his eyes. In Winesburg, Seth Richmond was called the Deep One. He's like his father, men said as he went through the streets. He'll break out some of these days. You wait and see. The talk of the town, and the respect with which men and boys instinctively greeted him, as all men greet silent people, had affected Seth Richmond's outlook on life and on himself. He, like most boys, was deeper than boys are given, given credit for being, but he was not what the men of the town, and even his mother, thought him to be. No great underlying purpose lay back of his habitual silence, and he had no definite plan for his life. When the boys with whom he associated were noisy and quarrelsome, he stood quietly at one side. With calm eyes he watched the gesticulating, lively figures of his companions. He wasn't particularly interested in what was going on, and sometimes wondered if he would ever be particularly interested in anything. Now, as he stood in the half-darkness by the window watching the baker, he wished that he himself might become thoroughly stirred by something, even if by the fits of sullen anger for which Baker Groff was noted. It would be better for me if I could become excited and wrangle about politics like windy old Tom Willard, he thought, as he left the window and went again along the hallway to the room occupied by his friend, George Willard. Well, George Willard was older than Seth Richmond, but in the rather odd friendship between the two, it was he who was forever courting, and the younger boy who was being courted. The paper on which George worked had one policy. 
it strove to mention by name, in each issue, as many as possible of the inhabitants of the village. Like an excited dog, George Willard ran here and there, noting on his pad of paper who had gone on business to the county seat, or had returned from a visit to a neighboring village. All day he wrote little facts upon the pad. A. P. Ringlet had received a shipment of straw hats. Ed Beyerbaum and Tom Marshall were in Cleveland Friday. Uncle Tom Sinnings is building a new barn on his place on the Valley Road. The idea that George Willard would some day become a writer had given him a place of distinction in Winesburg, and to Seth Richmond he talked continually of the matter. It's the easiest of all lives to live, he declared, becoming excited and boastful. Here and there you go, and, and there's no one to boss you. Though you are in India or in the South Seas in a boat, you have but to write, and there you are. Wait till I get my name up, and then see what fun I shall have. In George Willard's room, which had a window looking down on an alleyway, and one that looked across railroad tracks to Biff Carter's lunchroom facing the railroad station, Seth Richmond sat in a chair and looked at the floor. George Willard, who had been sitting for an hour idly playing with a lead pencil, greeted him effusively. "'I've been trying to write a, a love story,' he explained, laughing nervously. Lighting a pipe, he began walking up and down the room. "'I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fall in love. I've been sitting here and thinking it over, and I'm going to do it.' As though embarrassed by his declaration, George went to a window and, turning his back to his friend, leaned out. "'I know who I'm going to fall in love with,' he said sharply. "'It's Helen White. She's the only girl in town with any get-up to her.' Struck with his new idea, young Willard turned and walked toward his visitor. "'Look here,' he said. "'You know Helen White better than I do. I want you to tell her what I said. You just get to talking to her and say that I'm in love with her. See what she says to that, and see how she takes it. And then you come and tell me. Seth Richmond arose and went toward the door. The words of his comrade irritated him unbearably. Well, goodbye, he said briefly. George was amazed. Running forward, he stood in the darkness, trying to look into Seth's face. "'What's the matter with you? What are you going to do? You stay here and let's talk,' he urged. A wave of resentment directed against his friend, the men of the town who were, he thought, perpetually talking of nothing, and most of all against his own habit of silence, made Seth half desperate. "'Oh, speak to her yourself!' he burst forth, and then, going quickly through the door, slammed it sharply in his friend's face. "'I'm going to find Helen White and talk to her, but not about him,' he muttered. Seth went down the stairway and out the front door of the hotel, muttering with wrath. Crossing a little dusty street and climbing a low iron railing, he went to sit upon the grass in the station yard. George Willard he thought a profound fool, and he wished that he had said so more vigorously. Although his acquaintanceship with Helen White, the maker's daughter, was outwardly but casual, she was often the subject of his thoughts, and he felt that she was something private and personal to himself. "'The busy fool with his love stories,' he muttered, staring back over his shoulder at George Willard's room. "'Why does he never tire of his eternal talking?' 
It was berry harvest time in Winesburg, and upon the station platform men and boys loaded the boxes of red, fragrant berries into two express cars that stood upon the siding. A June moon was in the sky, although in the west a storm threatened, and no street lamps were lighted. In the dim light the figures of the men standing upon the express truck and pitching the boxes in at the doors of the cars were but dimly discernible. Upon the iron railing that protected the station lawn sat other men. Pipes were lighted. Village jokes went back and forth. Away in the distance a train whistled, and the men loading the boxes into the cars worked with renewed activity. Seth arose from his place on the grass and went silently past the men perched upon the railing and into Main Street. He had come to a resolution. "'I'll get out of here,' he told himself. "'What good am I here? I'm going to some city and go to work. I'll tell Mother about it tomorrow." Seth Richmond went slowly along Main Street, past Wacker's Cigar Store and the Town Hall, and into Buckeye Street. He was depressed by the thought that he was not a part of the life of his own town, but the depression did not cut deeply, as he did not think of himself as at fault. In the heavy shadows of a big tree before Dr. Welling's house, he stopped and stood watching half-witted Turk Smollett, who was pushing a wheelbarrow in the road. The old man, with his absurdly boyish mind, had a dozen long boards on the wheelbarrow, and, as he hurried along the street, balanced the load with extreme nicety. "'Easy there, Turk! Steady now, old boy!' the old man shouted to himself, and laughed so that the load of boards rocked dangerously. Seth knew Turk Smollett, the half-dangerous old woodchopper whose peculiarities added so much of color to the life of the village. He knew that when Turk got into Main Street, he would become the center of a whirlwind of cries and comments, that in truth the old man was going far out of his way in order to pass through Main Street and exhibit his skill in wheeling the boards. If George Willard were here, he'd have something to say, thought Seth. George belongs to this town. He'd shout at Turk, and Turk would shout at him. They'd both be secretly pleased by what they had said. It's different with me. I, I don't belong. I, I'll not make a fuss about it, but I'm going to get out of here. Seth stumbled forward through the half-darkness, feeling himself an outcast in his own town. He began to pity himself, but a sense of the absurdity of his thoughts made him smile. In the end, he decided that he was simply old beyond his years, had not at all a subject for self-pity. I'm made to go to work. I may be able to make a place for myself by steady working, and I might as well be at it, he decided. Seth went to the house of Banker White and stood in the darkness by the front door. On the door hung a heavy brass knocker, an innovation introduced into the village by Helen White's mother, who had also organized a women's club for the study of poetry. Seth raised the knocker and let it fall. Its heavy clatter sounded like a report from distant guns. How awkward and foolish I am, he thought. If Mrs. White comes to the door, I won't know what to say. Well, it was Helen White who came to the door and found Seth standing at the edge of the porch. Blushing with pleasure, she stepped forward, closing the door softly. I'm going to get out of town. I don't know what I'll do, but I'm going to get out of here and go to work. I think I'll go to Columbus, he said. 
Perhaps I'll get into the state university down there. Anyway, I'm going. I'll tell Mother tonight. He hesitated and looked doubtfully about. Perhaps you wouldn't mind coming to walk with me? And Seth and Helen walked through the streets beneath the trees. Heavy clouds had drifted across the face of the moon, and before them in the deep twilight went a man with a short ladder upon his shoulder. Hurrying forward, the man stopped at the street crossing and, putting the ladder against the wooden lamp post, lighted the village light so that their way was half lighted, half darkened, by the lamps and by the deepening shadows cast by the low-branched trees. In the tops of the trees the wind began to play, disturbing the sleeping birds so that they flew about, calling plaintively. In the lighted space before one of the lamps, two bats wheeled and circled, pursuing the gathering swarm of night flies. Since Seth had been a boy in knee trousers, there had been a half-expressed intimacy between him and the maiden who now for the first time walked beside him. For a time she had been beset with a madness for writing notes which she addressed to Seth. He had found them concealed in his books at school, and one had been given him by a child met in the street, while several had been delivered through the village post office. The notes had been written in a round, boyish hand, and had reflected a mind inflamed by novel reading. Seth had not answered them, although he had been moved and flattered by some of the sentences scrawled in pencil upon the stationery of the banker's wife. Putting them into the pocket of his coat, he went through the street or stood by the fence in the schoolyard with something burning at his side. He thought it fine that he should be thus selected as the favorite of the richest and most attractive girl in town. Helen and Seth stopped by a fence near where a low, dark building faced the street. The building had once been a factory for the making of barrel staves, but was now vacant. Across the street, upon the porch of a house, a man and woman talked of their childhood, their voices coming clearly across to the half-embarrassed youth and maiden. There was a sound of scraping chairs, and the man and woman came down the gravel path to a wooden gate. Standing outside the gate, the man leaned over and kissed the woman. For old time's sake, he said, and turning, walked rapidly away along the sidewalk. That's Bell Turner, whispered Helen, and put her hand boldly into Seth's hand. I didn't know that she had a fellow. I thought she was too old for that. Seth laughed uneasily. The hand of the girl was warm and a strange, dizzy feeling crept over him. Into his mind came a desire to tell her something he had been determined not to tell. "'George Willard's in love with you,' he said, and in spite of his agitation, his voice was low and quiet. "'He's writing a story, and he wants to be in love. He wants to know how it feels.' He wanted me to tell you and see what you said. Again, Helen and Seth walked in silence. They came to the garden surrounding the old Richmond place and going through a gap in the hedge sat on a wooden bench beneath a bush. On the street, as he walked beside the girl, new and daring thoughts had come into Seth Richmond's mind. He began to regret his decision to get out of town. It would be something new and altogether delightful to remain and walk often through the streets with Helen White, he thought. 
In imagination, he saw himself putting his arm about her waist and feeling her arms clasped tightly about his neck. One of those odd combinations of events and places made him connect the idea of love-making with this girl and a spot he had visited some days before. He had gone on an errand to the house of a farmer who lived on a hillside beyond the fairground and had returned by a path through a field. At the foot of the hill below the farmer's house, Seth had stopped beneath a sycamore tree and looked about him. A soft humming noise had greeted his ears. For a moment he had thought the tree must be the home of a swarm of bees. And then, looking down, Seth had seen the bees everywhere all about him in the long grass. He stood in a mass of weeds that grew waist-high in the field that ran away from the hillside. The weeds were abloom with tiny purple blossoms and gave forth an overpowering fragrance. Upon the weeds the bees were gathered in armies, singing as they worked. Seth imagined himself lying on a summer evening, buried deep among the weeds beneath the tree. Beside him, in the scene built in his fancy, lay Helen White, her hand lying in his hand. A peculiar reluctance kept him from kissing her lips, but he felt he might have done that if he'd wished. Instead, he lay perfectly still, looking at her and listening to the army of bees that sang the sustained masterful song of labor above his head. On the bench in the garden, Seth stirred uneasily. Releasing the hand of the girl, he thrust his hands into his trouser pockets. A desire to impress the mind of his companion with the importance of the resolution he had made came over him, and he nodded his head toward the house. "'Mother'll make a fuss, I suppose,' he whispered. "'She hasn't thought at all about what I'm going to do in life. "'She thinks I'm going to stay on here forever, just being a boy.' Seth's voice became charged with boyish earnestness. "'You see, I've got to strike out. "'I've got to get to work. "'It's what I'm good for.' Helen White was impressed. She nodded her head, and a feeling of admiration swept over her. This is as it should be, she thought. This boy is not a boy at all, but a, but a strong, purposeful man. Certain vague desires that had been invading her body were swept away, and she sat up very straight on the bench. The thunder continued to rumble, and flashes of heat lightning lit up the eastern sky. The garden that had been so mysterious and vast, a place that, with Seth beside her, might have become the background for strange and wonderful adventures, now seemed no more than an ordinary Winesburg backyard, quite definite and limited in its outlines. "'What will you do up there?' she whispered. Seth turned half around on the bench, striving to see her face in the darkness. He thought her infinitely more sensible and straightforward than George Willard, and was glad he had come away from his friend. A feeling of impatience with the town that had been in his mind returned, and he tried to tell her of it. "'Everyone talks and talks,' he began. "'I'm sick of it. "'I'll do something, get into some kind of work where talk don't count. "'Maybe I'll just be a mechanic in a shop. "'I don't know. "'I guess I don't care much. "'I just want to work and keep quiet. "'That's all I've got in my mind. Seth arose from the bench and put out his hand. 
He did not want to bring the meeting to an end, but could not think of anything more to say. "'It's the last time we'll see each other,' he whispered. A wave of sentiment swept over Helen. Putting her hand upon Seth's shoulder, she started to draw his face down toward her own upturned face. The act was one of pure affection and cutting regret that some vague adventure that had been present in the spirit of the night would now never be realized. I think I'd better be going along she said, letting her hand fall heavily to her side. A thought came to her. Don't you go with me. I want to be alone, she said. You go and talk with your mother. You'd better do that now. Seth hesitated, and as he stood waiting, the girl turned and ran away through the hedge. A desire to run after her came to him, but he only stood staring, perplexed and puzzled by her action, as he had been perplexed and puzzled by all of the life of the town out of which she had come. Walking slowly toward the house, he stopped in the shadow of a large tree and looked at his mother sitting by a lighted window, busily sewing. The feeling of loneliness that had visited him earlier in the evening returned and colored his thoughts of the adventure through which he had just passed. Ha! Huh! he exclaimed, turning and staring in the direction taken by Helen White. That's how things'll turn out. She'll be like the rest. I suppose she'll begin now to look at me in a funny way. He looked at the ground and pondered this thought. She'll be embarrassed and feel strange when I'm around, he whispered to himself. That's how it'll be. That's how everything will turn out. When it comes to loving someone, it won't never be me. It'll be someone else, some fool, someone who talks a lot. Someone like that George Willard.